Hello Hunters, Peppo here, welcome back to my channel. Today will be my first video not directly related to Monster Hunter. I played a new hunting game named Wild Hearts in this last period and I wanted to share my opinion about this game developed by Omega Force and published by Electronic Arts under its EA Originals label. I received a copy from EA as a content creator, so I took this opportunity to try the game and let you guys know what I think about it. So thank you EA for giving me this copy. Although the game belongs to the hunting game genre, in my personal experience after playing Monster Hunter for more than 13 years, it felt pretty different, especially from a gameplay perspective, which is the aspect I give the most attention to. That said, I'm not going to compare these two games one on one simply because they are too distinct from each other in my opinion, as they give you their own unique way of gameplay feeling. Nonetheless, I will mention Monster Hunter as well as other games in this video just to have a reference and to help you better understand some mechanics and aspects of Wild Hearts. So without further ado, let's start! The game setting is clearly inspired by feudal Japan, kinda like Ghost of Tsushima, but in a more fantasy way because of the presence of massive giant monsters called Kemono, and new special devices called Karakuri, which allows the hunter to create several different types of buildings, something a bit like Fortnite, but in a much more diverse and unique way. These kimonos are basically a fusion of animals and nature, very few of them somewhat reminded me of monsters from the Monster Hunter series, while the majority felt completely different, especially in how they move and attack the hunter. I'll talk more about the hunt later in the video. The concept design for these monsters differs a lot from Monster Hunter, as they are obviously created based on real-life animals like rabbits, porcupines or birds, while in Monster Hunter the beasts are mostly dragons and wyverns. The Karakuri system is what makes this game different from any other hunting game and plays a key role in the gameplay. Getting used to it and learning how to properly use it is fundamental if you want to gain a decisive advantage in the fight. This system is divided into three categories. Basic Karakuri, which consists of six different types of devices and can only be crafted by spending Karakuri threads, the material you need to have to conjure them. Fusion Karakuri, which are structures you can build by fusing basic Karakuri. And finally Dragon Karakuri, which are really specific buildings or tools that you can create in various types of situations. These last ones don't need Karakuri threads to be crafted, but there is a limit to the number of which you can create. Each map has several Dragon Pits. You have to first unlock and then upgrade them. The higher the level of these pits, the more capacity they will gain and so the more Dragon Karakuri you will be able to create. You will unlock new Karakuri and upgrade the ones you already possess by further progressing into the game by spanning Kimono Orbs, which are obtained hunting Kimonos, in this never-ending tree you see on screen. Basic and Fusion Karakuri are devices mostly utilized during the fight. Crates and springs, for example, allow the hunter to perform powerful air attacks while fusing three springs, for example, will get you a big ass hammer that can damage kimonos. Whereas Dragon Karakuri is more used to reaching certain areas, for example with the Flying Vine, extremely helpful to reach far and hard to reach spots, but it also includes important buildings like camps or forges. All these types of buildings can be placed anywhere inside the maps of Wild Hearts, and this is one of the best parts in my opinion. Setting up camps wherever you want will allow you to fast travel in any part of the map, as long as you place a camp there. All these structures will not disappear after you completed a quest, but they will remain there forever. This is one of those aspects that I believe they improved from the camping system of Monster Hunter World and Rise. The maps are a bit larger and more vertical, so you need something to deal with it. You can use rollers to cover fast long distances, you can use wind vortex to get to higher areas, or you can use flying vines to do both. I generally enjoy the exploration part of this game, maybe even more than how Monster Hunter World did it. Talking of which, there are no scout flies here in this game. However, you can rely on the hunter's vision to identify the position of kimonos or karakuri thread spots located in the near. This vision can be manually triggered and only lasts a few seconds, so it's less invasive than the scout flies and doesn't have any annoying camera lock feature. In Wild Hearts, you can recover from injuries by drinking healing water. These are basically mega potions, but they cannot be stocked inside a box or crafted like in Monster Hunter. You can bring a fixed amount of them in a quest and once you finish them you can't restock, but you can gather them from specific plants scattered on the map. 
Another way to collect the healing water is by constructing a well near ancient trees to draw healing water. And this doesn't cost anything, but you can only draw healing waters from an ancient tree once per quest. A surprisingly big topic in this game is food. Like in Monster Hunter, you can eat to gain boost to your HP, stamina, attack and defense, but this time you need to handle the whole process from gathering the food to cooking it. It is incredibly time consuming to manage it properly. If you want, you can eat raw food without caring about cooking it, but the buffs will be lower of course. While if you really want to get the most out of food, you need to find it and gather it first. Then you can decide if you want to pickle or dry it, and finally you can smoke it. The game doesn't force you to invest a lot of your time to manage food, but you can gain a big advantages if you do so. It would have been almost impossible to fully understand how the food system works in this game if it wasn't for Fementos video. Thanks fam, I really appreciate your video about the food in Wild Hearts, it was really helpful. The game doesn't explain much about the system, so you need to figure it out yourself. The next big topic is armor and weapon crafting. The armor system is decent, but I am not particularly impressed with how it works. Each armor is divided into 5 pieces like Monster Hunter, so we have helms, chests, arms, coils and legs. Each piece has a defense value, 5 elemental defense values and skills. The difference comes from the way these armors can be upgraded. You can either choose to upgrade one piece of armor toward the human path or the kimono path. Each piece has a value that indicates which path belongs to and how impactful is the such path. You can decide if you want to upgrade the armor following the human or the kimono path. In the end, the game will sum up all these values and that will settle the kimono path of your whole armor. Unfortunately, not all armor pieces can be upgraded and this is a bit of a disappointment to me. Moreover, many skills don't seem very helpful, which means there is no great variety in terms of skills you will actually use for your hunts. There are charms, but they work a bit differently from Monster Hunter. You can equip up to 5 talismans. Every charm has a cost and you can't exceed the total cost of 50. You can either have 1 or 2 skills per charm and there are no slots and so no jewels. And the same applies to the armor. While for the weapons I actually like what they did. Each weapon type has a weapon tree as you see on the screen. You can choose which branch you want to follow to upgrade the weapon, but you can upgrade in any direction. This was made because every weapon has skills called inherited skills that can be transferred to the following weapon. In this way you can grab the inherited skills you want from each weapon and put them on your favorite one. This system is incredibly interesting and customizable and I feel like they nailed it. Each weapon has also one or two inherent skills which only belong to that specific weapon and cannot be transferred from one weapon to another. Also like in Monster Hunter each weapon has a damage type which can be sever, blunt or shot, an attack value, an elemental value and an affinity value. The status works a bit differently though. It can either be an inherent skill or you can even put it as a skill on the charm. This means that any weapon can apply status as long as you have the skills equipped, which is definitely an interesting aspect in my opinion. Even in this game we have a buddy who will follow us in solo hunting quests. These companions are called Tsukumo and work kinda like the Palico from Monster Hunter, although there are some little differences like the way you can upgrade them. They can heal you and provide support by giving Karakuri threats if you run out of them for example. The Tsukumo feels definitely less aggressive and strong than Palico or Palamutes, and the monster basically never targets him unless they voluntarily draw attention if the hunter is in danger, and this aspect is something I really enjoy. I always wanted to have a companion that is invisible for most of the hunt and only shows himself when I need him. I don't really like how powerful the Palico and especially the Palamute are in Rise and Sunbreak, but this is just my personal opinion of course. Well then, it's time to talk about the hunt, the gameplay experience, the most important aspect of the game. I've been playing for more than 100 hours when this video will be released, I fought all the monsters in the game, reached the end game, played solo and online with a friend. The game progression is good, but it is highly conditioned by the weapon you will decide to wield. In my experience, I played from the beginning to the end with the bladed Wagaza, a lightweight close range weapon that looks like an umbrella. I wanted to try out something completely new, that's why I didn't want to use the katana this time, and I don't have any regret. The bladed Wagaza is an extremely satisfying weapon to use and even more to master. It requires a good amount of practice for the parries and high attention to stamina management, but once you learn it, it feels really satisfying. 
The parry is still harder to perform than the roll dodge, it looks like the iframe window is way more narrow. I'm planning to bring some gameplay I made with bladed Wagaz on some good matchups in the future on the channel, so you will see with your eyes how cool this weapon is. There is no counterpart in Monster Hunter for this weapon. It is rapid like dual blades, but it can attack in mid-air like an inset delay. After you execute a parry, you have this counter which gives a similar feeling to the longsword in 5th jet. Other than that, the general experience is completely different from any weapon we have in Monster Hunter, and that's an excellent thing for this game. Although I didn't play the other weapon myself, I know some friends of mine who played other weapons, and they told me that bow and the cannon are extremely powerful and in the case of the cannon, it is also relatively easy and safe compared to the rest of the weapons. Which brings us to the old topic of weapon balancing. Like in Monster Hunter, where ranged weapons were and always will probably be the strongest weapons of the game, even here in Wild Hearts we have some problems with balancing ranged weapons. Of course, the game just got released, so I hope the devs will consider trying to balance the weapons as much as possible and improve this aspect of the game as well in the future. There is already a positive sign that goes in this direction, the fact that there is no sharpness, which means melee weapons don't have the disadvantage of losing power due to the sharpness drop. This is one of those little details that improve the experience in my opinion. Anyway, we shouldn't expect perfect weapon balancing at the release of a brand new hunting game, given that Monster Hunter after 20 years still wasn't able to achieve such an objective. Back to the progression, the game is divided somewhat like in Monster Hunter into low and high rank. The jump from one rank to the other is pretty high, and I did card myself several times especially with specific hard monsters during my playthrough. Most monsters can easily kill you with two attacks, it's really scary. So yeah, the challenge is definitely there. It's not an easy game, but that, again, is probably dependent on the weapon you will use. The hunt, the fight, is refreshing. It didn't feel like Monster Hunter to me for basically all the monsters. The kimono in general are more aggressive and don't give you many openings, and this is especially true with the lava back or the amber plume, two monsters I've struggled with for a while in the beginning. The fight is pretty fast paced and you constantly need to be ready to dodge or parry kimono's attacks. This is the case for solo play. While in multiplayer, as the monster is targeting other hunters, you have a bit more time to think and attack without too much to be worried about. One of the positive aspects I want to point out is the fact that the hunter, even when he has the weapon drawn, can still interact with the environment with great agility. You can perform pretty much every action with your weapon drawn, without the need of sheathing it. You can gather materials, conjure karakuri, and carve kimono materials. The fights generally take place in wide areas, so most of the time you have plenty of space to move around. However, ledges, collisions and elevation changes are there, like in Monster Hunter, unfortunately, and that might worsen your hunt experience in some cases. A huge improvement though is the monster spawn and in general the monster iteration between each other. Monsters cannot spawn together in the same area, which is a great thing that Monster Hunter still hasn't fixed, but most importantly, even if a monster changes area and goes to where another monster already is, one of them will be forced to leave, so that the fight will always be one-on-one -on -one between the hunter and the monster, without the need of any monster from invading the area and causing trouble to the hunt. This is something I really appreciate. There are also Tarf Wars, although I think I only saw one or maybe two of them in my 100 hours of playtime, so yeah, they are extremely rare, which is completely fine to me as I'm not a big fan of them anyway. Unfortunately, Wild Hearts doesn't only improve some of the Monster Hunter's mechanics, sometimes they brought back aspects of that game I wish never existed in the first place. I'm specifically talking about those aspects of the fight that I never liked in Monster Hunter and for any weird reason they decided to bring back in Wild Hearts. I'm talking about monsters roars before they leave the area, and the unstoppable limp when they are fleeing. On top of that, in Wild Hearts it seems the kimono are forced to leave the area according to their HPs, which makes it even worse since you can't basically slay the monster in the same area as they spawned, no matter how fast and good you play, but you will need to chase after them until they reach another area and then finish them. Hopefully this will be changed in the future. Of course, there are ways to deal with these little annoying mechanics, like by using earplugs to be immune to the roars or blocking kimonos with traps before they try to leave, but I don't consider these proper solutions, so I hope this will get changed in the future. And here is the following topic, Karakuri during the fight. Although at the beginning I was really skeptical about this new mechanic, I ended up liking it in the end. The Karakuri is what makes this game feel unique and refreshing. Basic Karakuri like raids, springs and gliders are really fun to use in the middle of the fight, 
giving the hunter another way to move around faster and being able to perform aerial attacks, which in the case of the bladed wagaza are well balanced with the rest of the weapon's move pool. Sometimes it's really important to cover distances in a short amount of time, recover stamina or simply escape from danger. And basic Arakuri makes this possible, but not just that. Their implementation feels very natural with the feeling and pace of the hunt. Then we have Fusion Karakuri, which can offer different types of support. You can build structures to deflect specific Kemono's attacks, making them flinch or topple and so gaining important openings. We can create tools that heal us or defend from Kemono's elemental attacks. Or we can build different types of traps to immobilize the monster and get openings in this way. Dragon Karakuri is not generally used during fights as it plays a more important role in the exploration, the traveling and the fruit process. The gameplay overall is fun, it works. Karakuri feels easy and natural to use. You need some practice of course if you really want to handle them with such ease, but it's definitely not hard to do so. I personally like a lot the basic Karakuri, especially the spring and the glider, while I'm not a big fan of fusion Karakuri abuse when it comes to conjuring traps to immobilize the monster. It feels like you are continually chaining shock traps and pitfalls like in Monster Hunter, which is something I don't personally like to do. But while in Monster Hunter the usage of traps is more a tool to get openings for inexperienced players since they don't know how to naturally exploit the openings the monster is giving, here in Wild Hearts, Kemonos usually don't give you openings to exploit and so it is much harder to find the time to land proper attacks to the monster. As a consequence, it's like the game is pushing you to use such Karakuri traps to momentarily block the Kemono and get an opening to attack them in this way. I would have loved to have more natural openings during the fight so that I don't feel forced to use these traps to get the time to land my strong attacks. But other than this little critique, I'm actually positively surprised with how good the gameplay feels. I wasn't expecting it to be this fun, to be honest. I wouldn't have played more than 100 hours if the gameplay was boring, this is for sure. Well then, let's talk about the end game. Do you remember when I talked about the talismans? Well, basically the end game consists of farming them. But thankfully, this is not Monster Hunter Rise and we don't have a completely RNG charm system. In Wild Hearts, every monster has a pool of possible charms that can drop, so that we can specifically farm a monster to get the talisman with the skills we want. This system is extremely efficient and enjoyable in my opinion. Once you finish the story, new powerful kimonos will start to appear. Kinda like the tempered monsters in Monster Hunter World, they have more HP and hit harder. There are even arch-tempered monsters like, with new additional moves and new ways to chain existing attacks. They are really tough and can even one-shot you. Consider that after 100 hours more or less, I'm still trying to craft all the elemental weapons I want with the perfect inherited skills. It's pretty grinding to get all the materials and you might run out of money too. I also have to manage the food, which takes quite some time as well. The team behind the game already announced that there will be free title updates that will further expand the endgame adding new kimonos to hunt, and this together bodes well, don't you think so? And lastly, I want to talk about the performance of the game, in my case on PC. This is probably the only severe problem I experienced, but it is fair and important to mention it since it might impact your experience as well. In my experience, the game doesn't seem to be well optimized for PC at the time of making this video. The more careful viewers already noticed that this video is not 2K60 and that's because I simply couldn't reach 60fps. The frame rate struggles a lot with this game. Even though I'm playing with a 3070 and a 5600X, I wasn't able to reach 60fps with low settings. Frame drops and stutters sometimes happened as well, and this was the only thing that ruined the fun of playing this game for me. Fortunately, I've been told that the dev team is aware of such problems and they are constantly working to find a fix. Hopefully they will manage to fully optimize Wild Hearts for PC and then nothing else will stop me from fully enjoying this game. All that remains is to patiently wait until they do so. Alright, before I forget, a very positive surprise in Wild Hearts is that all the controls are fully customizable. You can assign any buttons to a specific action, be it if you play with a controller or a keyboard. The default buttons were a bit difficult for me, so I changed them in a more similar way to Monster Hunter, so I don't get too confused. I really appreciated this option on the menu, it was pretty helpful. In conclusion, Wild Hearts is the surprise I wasn't expecting. Outside of the PC performance issue, I generally enjoy the game. It does have good potential and with some little fixes, it can really become a really fun new hunting game with a completely innovative style from what we have been used to with Monster Hunter. 
a new journey just started and hopefully it will get better and better the farther it goes on. This video was voiced, recorded and edited by myself, Peppo. I hope you enjoyed this video. In that case, please consider subscribing. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comment section below. See you in the next video, bye!